Good evening. I think you're going to find yourself disappointed after that generous introduction. But thank you, Wesley, very much. Uh, this is a Cuban hummingbird. It's called the Sun Sun, and the United States has a policy called a Zun Suneo that we'll talk about a little bit later. It's uh, the world's smallest bird. It's uh, sometimes called the bee hummingbird because it's about the size of a honeybee. Uh, it weighs about, the, uh, about as much as a dime. Uh, uh, we'll get back to, to this uh, uh, in due course, but uh, let me begin at the beginning. When Priya, whom I cannot see because the lighting is poor on my face in the audience, when Priya uh, asked me to send her a few words about what I'd like to discuss with you this evening, I replied that I wanted to talk about the most dysfunctional relationship in the history of United States foreign policy. Dysfunctional in the sense that it's not working. Uh, here we are, extremely close neighbors, but until 2016, the United States and Cuba had not had formal diplomatic relations for 56 years, January 3rd, 1961. That shatters every record. Uh, and this is with one of our closest neighbors. Uh, you want more dysfunction? Uh, well, still today, in 2018, we have an economic embargo with Cuba. That began in 1960, 12 presidents ago. By law, this embargo cannot be lifted until Cuba performs 17 different acts. One of them is, quote, having a free and fair election for a new government that does not include Fidel Castro or Raul Castro. Now, I think that is the only instance in our 242 year history as a nation where US law has stipulated the names of specific individuals that other countries' voters should not select as their leaders. Uh, more dysfunction? Uh, during the years since 1960, right up to today, the United States has been openly attempting to change the Cuban government. We have used almost every tactic short of an armed invasion. We have sabotaged power plants. We have dropped incendiary bombs on sugar fields. We have armed assassins. Uh, probably the most imaginative was a, a fountain pen with a hypodermic needle so fine that Fidel Castro would not recognize that he was being injected with poison. Wesley, how small would that needle have to be before you would say, ouch? <laughs> the, uh, Look, today we call this state-sponsored terrorism. Uh, now, none, none, of, none of this has achieved its goal, which is to remove the Cuban leaders who have held power since 1959. So, okay, it's the dysfunctional relationship. The obvious question is, why do we want to replace them? What, what is our grievance? Well, since the end of the Cold War in the early 1990s, the answer has been that the Cuban government is not democratic, and therefore it does not represent the will of the Cuban people. And I, I want to be clear before I go on. Uh, Cuba is not democratic. Uh, regardless of how you assess the successes and the shortcomings of the Cuban Revolution. Surely we can all in this room agree on one thing. Any, any government led by the same two brothers for over half a century without a competitive election is not a democracy. But neither is Saudi Arabia. 
with whose government we are the best of friends. What's the difference? Well, the undemocratic Saudis help to protect our interests, and the undemocratic Cubans threaten our interests. And that's what, of course, any foreign policy is supposed to do. It's supposed to protect and promote the interests of the country with the policy. Specifically, for Cuba, our policy has reflected the economic concerns of U.S. investors who lost a lot of money in the early 1960s. Then the security concerns of U.S. defense managers when Cuba became related with the Soviet Union. And since the end of the Cold War, the interests of domestic politics. What makes, what makes, look, any, any policy does that. It, it, it focuses on protecting economic, security, and domestic political interests. What makes Cuba an, an interesting case is because it is so extreme, it throws into really sharp relief the way that we in this country look at those tiny little countries that are in Latin America, down there beneath the United States. Uh, in, in, our, in our relationship with, with Cuba, you see a set of tightly integrated beliefs that control the way we think when someone says Cuba. You know, think, think, of, think, of, think of, uh, of, of an app, a, a, a piece of software in your brain called Cuba. And someone from the Department of State sitting in, in his or her office, someone knocks on the door, uh, says, do you have a minute to talk about Cuba? In, in less than a nanosecond, what happens is, is the person uh, who has been asked that question kind of moves, re reaches over, grabs, grabs this mental mouse, moves it across the desktop on the, on the mental computer, and clicks on the Cuba app. We, we all do this. We do it a thousand times a day. Uh, it, and all you have to do is say a word, say a word like Cuba, and, and you boot up your Cuba software. So, so what is this software? Uh, I'd like to talk about three beliefs that comprise the way we think about Cuba and then turn to how those beliefs affect the policy that we have today. Uh, the first is that we have a natural right to hegemony, to dominant influence over all those little countries that lie down there beneath the United States. Uh, this right is based upon the fact that we are rich and powerful, and countries like Cuba are not rich and powerful. Uh, our economy is 250 times larger than Cuba's. Th think, think, think of me as, as, as Cuba. I'm six feet tall. And think of me standing beside a giant that's 250 times bigger, that's 1,500 feet giant, foot high giant. Now for, for, for comparison, the Empire State Building's about 1,200, 1,300 feet high. Uh, and this, and this, this economic giant has used a substantial portion of its fabulous wealth to build the most powerful military in the history of the human race. And this raw strength has given U.S. officials, such as Secretary of State Alexander Haig, the ability to ask President Ronald Reagan for a simple green light. According to Nancy Reagan, First Lady, what Secretary Haig said to President Reagan is this. You just give me the word and I'll turn that effing island into a parking lot. Now, you may think that I've thrown up a slide that's atypical, 
but the archives are packed to overflowing with sentences like that about Latin America and especially about Cuba, all of which seem to suggest a belief in, in hegemony and in, in our predominant influence. Uh, what, what I think would seem strange to a visitor from another planet is why when the Cubans refused to behave as Washington insisted that their country was not turned into a parking lot. Uh, you know, why, why didn't we squish them? Well, the early answer, of course, is that, is that Cuba did which, what weak countries have done since time immemorial. They allied themselves with the rival power, the Soviet Union. But that, that meant that now Cuba didn't simply threaten our economic interests, it also threatened our security interests. But an invasion, an invasion might lead the Soviet Union to react. Uh, at the time, back in the early 1960s, the principal concern was that the Soviet Union would do something in Berlin. Uh, and that could easily lead to war. So for three decades, we used almost every other weapon we had short of an invasion, right down to that fountain pen with the hypodermic needle. Uh, and then the Cold War ended. Cuba was no longer a threat to our interests in, in, the, in the sense of our security interests. And our economic interests really had in large measure melted away and maybe their economic interest was more in a uh, rapprochement. Uh, the people who lost most of their money in Cuba had written off their losses with taxes years earlier. So, so uh, what were the interests that kept us hostile? Well, what had happened, of course, is that during the Cold War years, the United States had developed a new domestic political interest, specifically the electoral interests of US policy in attempting to secure the votes of Cuban Americans living in Florida. There are 850,000 Cuban Americans in Florida, a large proportion of whom still vote today on the basis of how hostile an individual candidate or a political party is to the Cuban Revolution. So if you want to explain today's embargo, you don't have to look any further. Uh, okay, that's our first belief. The second belief that underlies this Cuba app uh, and I have to be a little careful here. It's a belief that the region's inhabitants are an inferior branch of the human species. Um, well, let me, let me just show you what a U.S. ambassador wrote from Cuba back in, in 1946. He wrote basically, if you mix Hispanic and black, which is what Cuba is, you get a people that are lazy, that are cruel, that are unreliable, that are irresponsible and dishonest. Now, now some of you, I hope almost all of you will at least wince a little bit when you see sentences like that uh, so we look for euphemisms. Uh, my generation's word for inferior has been underdeveloped. Uh, Washington today prefers the word developing. These are developing people. Uh, now, I need to point out that this sentence by Ambassador Norweb is, is no abnormality. I could go back from 1946 to the beginning of the 20th century and find 
President Theodore Roosevelt talking about these strange, turbulent little half-caste civilizations, or I could go forward to as little as two weeks ago when President Donald Trump said, well, you know what he said, or what he is said to have said, and you know for sure what he said about Mexicans as he announced his candidacy for the presidency in 2016. President Trump is unusual today because he is uncensored. He says what he appears to believe, but as you know, he says what many think or say only privately. In any event, it's probably a sign of progress that U.S. diplomats no longer write sentences like that. But today's political correctness uh, makes research much more difficult. Uh, today, you have to observe behavior and then in, infer this belief in Latin Americans' inferiority. Now, we'll get back to that research problem in just a couple of minutes, but, but before that, we need to talk about the third belief. The first is about hegemony, the second is about Latin Americans' inferiority, and the third belief in our Cuba app is, is the firm conviction that developed countries like the United States have a responsibility to improve underdeveloped peoples like the Cubans. Uh, in the case of Cuba, we can trace this belief back to the early 20th century. Uh, as you all know, uh, the Spanish-American War of 1898 yielded the United States its, its first colonies in Latin America, uh, Puerto Rico, the Philippines, uh, uh, Guam and, and, and Cuba. Uh, we held Cuba for four years. Then, then when we were preparing to grant Cuba its independence, we created a law, uh, an amendment to the Army Appropriations Bill for 1902 that gave the United States the right to re-enter Cuba whenever we wished for the protection of life, property, and individual liberty. This is called the Platt Amendment, uh, named after Senator Orville Platt, the chair at the time of the Committee on Relations with Cuba. Uh, it made the, it made, it, this is our first protectorate uh, we, we essentially created five different protectorates in the Caribbean region uh, during, the, during the progressive era, the first couple of decades of the 20th century. And so in 1906, four years after we gave Cuba its independence, the United States exercised the right to take over Cuba for another three years. And President Theodore Roosevelt had to explain why he was doing this. And what he said was, we have this obligation. Uh, I'm seeking the very minimum of infer inter interference to make them good. OK, that was back more than a century ago. But fast forward, if you will, for a second with me to 1991. Uh, that was when a reporter asked the first President Bush if he was planning on engaging with Fidel Castro now that the Soviet Union was imploding and our security interest was no longer an, an issue. And President Bush's response was, what's the point? Uh, all I'd tell him was to give the people the freedom that they want and then we would do what we should do go down and lift those people up. Now, President Bush's seven immediate predecessors always answered that Cuba first had to sever its relationship with Moscow. But here in 1991, 1992, uh, 
came, came the, the first law that now governs our policy toward Cuba, and it's called in 1992, this law is called the, the Cuban Democracy Act. And then in 1996, we passed another one called the Cuban Liberty and Democratic Solidarity Act, also known as the Helms-Burton Act. This belief that the United States should take responsibility for in improving Cuba's governance uh, has been evident f for more than a century. Uh, our first governor general of Cuba, uh, was put, he put his finger exactly on the problem that we have today. He, he said, look, we, don't, we really don't care, but we, we really have to make sure that the right people are in office. He, he the class in R, I understand he made a grammatical error there. He must see that the right class are in office before we can turn the government over. Now, what, what that meant in these circumstances is that we selected Cuba's first president. His name is Tomas Estrada Palma. He was Cuba born, but he was also a naturalized U.S. citizen who had been living in upstate New York for 25 years before he returned to Cuba. And he didn't return to Cuba until the ballots had been counted. Uh, that's getting the right class into office. We, we felt that we had this responsibility from the very beginning. Uh, the, the Cuba Democracy Act of 1992, the Helms-Burton Act of 1996, are just an indication of how little has changed. Uh, we believe that if you leave Cubans to their own devices, if you leave them to their own devices, backwards people like the Cubans are going to make poor choices. And those poor choices can affect our interests. In the case of Cuba, the, the, this, this effort to help them make good choices has always been episodic. We haven't had a continuous, we, we, we pop in and pop out, pop in and pop out. It began back in, in uh, 1906 when we took over Cuba again. Our, uh, the person responsible for the takeover was the Secretary of War, William Howard Taft, soon to be president. Uh, he, named, he went down to see what the trouble was in Cuba in 1906. He said, it's just such a mess, we have to take it over. And he named himself Provisional Governor of Cuba. It happened that shortly, shortly thereafter, the University of Havana was starting its school year. There is, a, there is an opening day ceremony and he decided to give a speech. And uh, look what he said. Uh, he, he's trying to encourage Cubans to confront their shortcomings. He said, look, you're an inferior people, belief too. But I'm here, I've taken over your country, and one of the things I want you to get to work on is the fact that uh, you, you, you young Cubans just aren't interested enough in, in, uh, in making money. Now, now jump ahead 110 years to 2016. When President Obama visited Cuba, and he spoke to the Cuban people, he had he had uh, he gave a speech in the most elaborate uh, auditorium that was broadcast on television to the entire country, and uh, he felt too that uh, he was compelled to point out to the Cubans some of their shortcomings, and here's what they were. Uh, he should, uh, again, this is, this is a visitor to Cuba coming, as we'll see in just a moment, essentially to end a long period of hostility, who decides to take it upon himself to tell the Cubans 
exactly what William Howard Taft had said, a different problem, of course, but exactly what William Howard Taft had said back in 1906. Now, imagine a foreign leader visiting the United States giving us a lecture about what we need to improve in this country. Uh, but for Cuba, that's what we've always done. It's normal. It's just the normal thing. Cuba, we just believe we need to do things like this. Okay, those are the principal beliefs that govern our thinking about Cuba and about many, many, many other countries. Uh, I could go on, but I only have 45 minutes. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to shift gears and focus on how these beliefs affect our policy today. Uh, and this is where, if you're interested, you can, you can watch the behavior of U.S. policymakers and then come to your own conclusion, make your own inferences about how these beliefs fit in or whether they fit in at all. Now, as, as any competent policy analyst will tell you, and uh, I don't know if you all are aware that Claremont McKenna has one of the nation's most distinguished policy analysts on his faculty, Bill Asher, and he's sitting at a table with a visitor uh, from Yale who is uh, also one of the nation's most distinguished policy analysts, Gary Brewer, who will be here for a couple of months. Uh, as I hope the two of them will not contradict me in saying. Uh, <laughs> If, if you want to analyze a policy, in our case, U.S. policy today toward Cuba, first of all, you have to identify the goal of any policy you are about to create. Uh, you know, what do you want to accomplish? Well, our goal since the beginning, as I, as I mentioned, be, when that is the 19th century, when there were pirates in the 1820s uh, having a resale shop in, in Havana's Harbor, our goal since the 19th century is to have a Cuba that does not threaten our interests. That's our goal. Then, having identified your goal, you have to select a strategy for reaching that goal. Since 1960, our strategy has been to replace the current Cuba government. Having selected your strategy, then your job is to select the specific steps, the tactics that you're going to use to implement the strategy that hopefully will allow you to reach the goal. Okay, I want to talk about those tactics. Uh, so far, we've used three. And see if these beliefs that I've mentioned have anything at all to do with any of these three. The first tactic was covert force. As I said, we didn't want to invade Cuba. That would be a very risky operation indeed in the dark days of the Cold War. But, and, and again, we don't have an awful lot of time here. So let me just ask you, uh, if you're interested in seeing the use of covert force, uh, just Google Bay of Pigs, uh, better yet, Google Operation uh, Mongoose. That, that was the part of that uh, was the hypodermic needle. There was also an exploding seashell uh, and several other items in that. But, but it, was, it was a, I mean, really, it, it was a use of force designed to overthrow the Cuban government. That was the tactic. In response, the Soviet Union put missiles in Cuba, and that led to the 1962 Cuban Missile Crisis that scared the bejabbers out of everybody. Uh, so a year later, after President Kennedy had been assassinated, a new president, Lyndon Johnson, inexperienced in foreign affairs, got on the telephone 10 days after Kennedy was assassinated. He called up J. William Fulbright, the well-respected chair of the Senate Committee on Foreign Relations, and he asked him what to do about Cuba. 
And uh, fortunately, they recorded the conversation. And, and uh, Lyndon, I mean, it's a little crude, I understand, but the basic idea is don't do anything like co this force, using force anymore. Just find a way to squeeze them. Uh, and a year later, his Lyndon Johnson's national security advisor, McGeorge Bundy, sent, sent the, the president a memo that, that said, look, we're going to have to live with this guy, uh, but we probably should just keep up our present nasty course. Now, what was that present nasty course? Uh, it was the embargo. That's tactic two. Covert, after the missile crisis, covert force disappeared. Uh, not overnight, it took a long time to get those Cuban-American uh, saboteurs to stop their, their raids in Cuba, but very slowly, um, over the course of about four years, using force disappeared, and the embargo became the nut-pinching, the squeezing. Uh, the, uh, this tactic, too, is basically the idea is do what you can do to harm the Cuban economy. Hurt the common citizen. Make their lives difficult. Deny them anything they might want from us, like tourists or a market for their sugar. Uh, the embargo continues to this day. Uh, sometimes it's relaxed a bit, sometimes it's tightened. Uh, just a couple of months ago on November 8th, it was tightened by the, by the administration, uh, generally believed to have been influenced heavily by Cuban-American Senator Marco Rubio. Uh, it's a lot harder now to do people-to-people -people exchanges with Cuba than it was before November 8th. So far, so far, tactic two has not worked. So without abandoning the embargo, we have set out on a new tactic of facilitating defense, d d dissent w within, within Cuba. Uh, and that's where we're focused today. Uh, campaigning in, in Florida in 2008, candidate Barack Obama told a Cuban-American audience that it's time for a new strategy. Now, he, he meant tactic, but forgive him that. Uh, it's time for a new strategy. I will maintain the embargo, tactic two, but immediately allow unlimited travel and remittances by Cuban Americans. It's time to let Cuban American money make their families less dependent upon the Castro regime. Now, ta tactic three is based upon the belief that everyday Cubans are disaffected. But, but they cannot do anything about it. Uh, the Cuban state security is a very strong state security. Uh, it, it knows what people are doing. Uh, so, so they're isolated. Tactic three, as it has evolved since 2008, uh, has come to mean giving Cubans the ability to end their isolation. Uh, Washington calls this building civil society. And, and this is, is from the Obama administration's request to Congress for $20 million in its annual appropriations in foreign affairs, an earmark of $20 million to promote civil society in Cuba. Now, Please, please don't judge this on the basis of whether these are good ideas. These are probably all good ideas, all right? It's that we are paying $20 million to encourage the Cubans to be able to have a stronger civil society, belief number three. Civil society is the aggregate of all the non-governmental organizations 
that voice the interests and the concerns of everyday citizens apart from and independent of the government. Social media has become the principal mechanism for building civil society in U.S. policy. Uh, and, you know, for some, for some government, social media has become the tool for implementing a foreign policy. The Russians apparently use social media to try to influence our election in 2016. In the case of Cuba, social media is a mechanism being used by the U.S. government to encourage dissent. The model for tactic three is the U.S. Tea Party. The idea was to get people together for tea, in quotation marks. Uh, once, once they were in touch with one another, uh, well, well, look, let, let's, let's, let's let them tell you themselves. This is from the Tea Party website for a couple months ago. And this, this is how it evolved. The gathering clouds that are being, crowds that are being mentioned here never met face to face uh, in a single place. But they got together via the media, via the Rush Limbaugh's, the Glenn Beck's, and so forth. Uh, disgruntled citizens started calling in. Uh, they started listening to other people who had their concerns. Uh, they had a, now a vehicle for expressing themselves and for really forming a virtual community of, of uh, like-minded individuals. This is exactly, folks, what we are trying to do today in Cuba with Tactic, tactic 3. Uh, meanwhile, in late 2014, for reasons really related to our our relations with the rest of Latin America, about which we can talk if you'd like later. In 2014, uh, after quietly negotiating an agreement with the Cuban government, President Obama made an announcement. He said that it does not serve America's interests, note that word, to try to push Cuba toward collapse. That's the embargo. And then in the State of the Union message, a month later, he said, we're ending a policy that has long passed its expiration date. When what you're doing, the embargo, doesn't work for 50 years, it's, try, it's, it's time to try a new tactic. Uh, now, to the extent permitted by the 1996 Helms-Burton Act, President Obama was saying that the embargo is over. He, he loosened it dramatically. That's one of the things that President Trump tightened last November. The something new was tactic three, an effort to build Cuba's civil society. A few months after this announcement, uh, Barack Obama and Raul Castro met in Panama and agreed to embark upon a new beginning. Uh, the two countries reopened their embassies in mid-2015. In March of 2016, President Obama visited Cuba, uh, and he, he said, I've come here to bury the last remnant of the Cold War. A month later, President Castro complained that the United States was using what he said other means to change Cuba's government. He was referring to Washington's effort to improve Cuba's civil society. Uh, and there's no debate here. All you have to do is look at the uh, website of the United States Agency for International Development, our primary foreign aid agents. And you'll see that we spent, during the Obama years, $155 million to improve civil society in Cuba. And you add to that the $20 million provided by the government-funded National Endowment for Democracy, 
170, 175 million dollars will buy you an awful lot of civil society building in, in Cuba today. How was it spent? Well, President Obama promised. He said, we will pursue democracy programming that is transparent. But then his administration expanded dramatically his predecessor's secret programs, the full range of which are still not known. Uh, these, these programs focus on technology to build a virtual civil society to assist Cuban citizens to communicate with one another without being observed by the Cuban government. And that brings us to the bird. It's an aid program. That this is a Sun Sun. Sun Sun is, a, is this tiny little, little hummingbird, Z-U-N, Z-U-N. The U.S. Agency for International Development had until recently a program called Sun Suneo. Uh, Sun Suneo would be a, a gathering of these birds. I think, think of, um, they're very tiny, so you have a hard time identifying it. Many, many people will say, I've heard them a lot. Cubans will tell you, I've heard these, these a lot, but all I hear is the noise of their wings. They're beating something like 80 times a second the wings, so you, you hear zoom, zoom, zoom. Uh, and, and he said they, uh, they dart around, as hummingbirds all do, and, and our zoom suneo was a gathering of these. Uh, it's like, look, it's like Woodstock was a gathering of hippies, okay, <laughs> or, or, or Burning Man is a, what is a gathering of strange people like my daughter uh, for us. Uh, Okay, so think, think, of, think of that kind of a, of a, of a situation. Uh, the idea was to build a site for, you know, look, we got $175 million to spend. Uh, why not spend some of it to build a, a program that ba basically it, it, it was to use money from the taxpayers of the United States create a Cuban Twitter, uh, but with more. It, it, was, it was a program of text messaging, email newsletters, a Facebook page, a Twitter account, a website, uh, all designed to look like it was from Cubans themselves. Cubans have, have plenty of cell phones. They have a lot of very, very poor internet connections, but there are plenty of cell phones in Cuba. And, and the idea was to, for us to kind of invade that with our ideas about building civil society, but make it look like there's just Cubans talking to one another. Uh, the email newsletter, for example, that was on this Twitter uh, and, and the Facebook, uh, the email newsletter was, was produced by a USAID contractor in Nicaragua. Uh, this, this program was entirely secret until the Associated Press got a hold of it in 2014. And uh, AID fessed up and said, look, we, we shut it down. Uh, uh, and and uh, they didn't say why they shut it down, but the Associated Press, the reporting team that broke the story, said that if exposed, it would be embarrassing. Well, why would it be embarrassing? Well, first of all, it would open the administration to charges of hypocrisy. After saying you're going to build civil society that is tra transparently, now all of a sudden you're doing things like this. So no one wants to be embarrassed in that way. But then also, and I think much more important, it would remind everyone of an even more embarrassing and still unsettled case of Alan Gross, which some of you may have heard of. Uh, Alan Gross had his own version of a Zun Suneo. It, it didn't have a name, but it was a, basically the same idea. He and his wife, Judy, were a two-person company that were specialized, that specialized in providing internet access where there is none, and, and also how to avoid prying eyes. 
like the eyes of Cuban security. They had an AID contract in Cuba as well, part of the $175 million. Alan Gross took his first of five trips to Cuba in early 19, excuse me, 2009, shortly after President Obama was inaugurated. He did each of these trips with Jewish groups participating in what, what are called people-to-people -people exchanges. And this one was with a small Jewish community in Cuba. Without their knowledge of his purpose, Gross spread the electronic equipment he needed among the luggage of the participants in this exchange. In his fourth trip, he carried 12 iPads, 11 smartphones, three computers, six external drives, three satellite modems, three routers, three controllers, 18 wireless access points, 13 memory sticks, and a bundle of networking switches. That's what the Cuban court found. When he got back home, he reported wireless networks established in three communities. On his, on his fifth trip, he was arrested while carrying a chip that would make that would, that would keep the Cuban authorities from locating satellite phone transmissions anywhere closer than 250 miles. Uh, this particular chip was said to be available only through U.S. intelligence agencies and the Department of Defense. I, I haven't been able to confirm that. Uh, he was charged with the law that prohibits quote, acts against Cuba's independence and territorial integrity. Uh, he told, he, 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 he poorly defended himself. Uh, he had lawyers, but they weren't going to do him any good. Uh, so he, he threw himself on the mercy of the court. He said, I am deeply sorry for being a trusting fool. I was duped. I was used. Now, the Cuban court found that unconvincing, as would any of you here if you, he wrote four post-trip reports, and all of them indicated he knew exactly what he was doing with AID's money. Uh, the Cuban court uh, sentenced him to 15 years in prison. Meanwhile, Judy Gross sued AID uh, when her husband was finally released in late 2014. Uh, after five years in Cuban jails where he lost almost all of his teeth. Uh, uh, AID settled with Gross for $3.2 million for five years of your life. Would you do it? Uh, okay, that's tactic three. Uh, no, one, no, one, no one outside the government knows how many of these we have. Least of all, I don't have any idea. Okay, my time is up, uh, so let me close by emphasizing, as I tried to by juxtaposing these time frame quotations, let me quote and by emphasizing how, how little seems to have changed. Uh, in the beginning, at the turn into the 20th century, the U.S. Army general in charge of Cuba repeatedly reported to Washington that it's next to impossible to make them believe that we have their own interests at heart. I've, uh, this is General Leonard Wood. Uh, I've gone through all of his papers and the papers of the people with whom he corresponded, particularly President Theodore Roosevelt. And I've, I'm absolutely convinced that General Wood never wondered why it was so difficult. He just, he just found it difficult, and, and he, never, he never, there's no hint that he was wondering, I, I wonder why it's so difficult to, to make them understand that we're just trying to help them. I'm, I'm also convinced that, that it's just because he believed about Cubans the may, way many of us today believe about those shithole countries beneath the United States. Uh, we're hegemonic, they're inferior, and for their development, they need the assistance of the United States. 
what General Wood failed to see in 1901, and what we are obviously still failing to see today, is that Cubans deeply, deeply resent that they are believed to be inferior and that the United States believes that Cubans need our help in order to develop. Uh, the message from the Cuban Revolution to the United States is this. We are a small country with a substantial number of very large problems. But we are the ones who are going to address it. If you in the United States refuse to recognize our right to self-determination, then there's no reason to talk any further. Cubans understand, of course, that they're living beside a 1,500-foot giant, and they know that they can't move. Uh, and they know also that we, you know, uh, and look at our government today, and you know, really, uh, they know that we can turn their country into a parking lot. Uh, but to capitulate would be such a blow to their self-respect uh, that a lot of the Cubans of my generation would rather go down fighting than to give in to this kind of thinking about their country. Now, maybe your generation will be a lot less dysfunctional, but until then, I'm afraid that's about the way we're going to have to end this tonight. I thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you very much, Professor. We now have time for questions. If you have a question, please raise your hand and either Wesley or I will come and hand you the mic. Priority goes to students. Uh, thank you for your talk. Um, so in criticizing the hegemonic power relationship that you see between the United States and Cuba, um, I was wondering if you could give some examples of some policies that the United States could take that would give a more egalitarian relationship between the United States and Cuba and that you think would potentially be more successful in maintaining that balance of power? Um, and do you think with respect to programs you mentioned, like the civil society building, uh, do you think programs that like that that aim to spread U.S. value should be abandoned entirely? Or do you think there's a more effective way of doing so in a more, um, on a more equal playing field that abandons those beliefs, three beliefs that you talked about? Fair enough. Uh, let me answer the second part first, can I? Uh, I? I really believe that the strength of the United States is to lead by example. Uh, I think when we get involved in the zunzuneos of this world, uh, we're probably making a, a grave error in our protecting our own interests. But uh, I asked Priya when I when I. She asked me, what do I want to speak about? And I, I gave her two options. I said, I'll, I'll be happy to talk about U.S.-Cuban relations. I've, I, 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 was, I was in high school when Fidel Castro marched into to Havana. And so I've, I've lived my whole life as a student of U.S.-Latin American relations with Fidel Castro and, and the Cuban Revolution. So I'm happy always to talk about that. But, but I said also, I've, I've been working on this, this book that, uh, that, that Wesley mentioned at the end of his kind introduction. It, it's called, it, its subtitle is uh, The U.S. Effort, a, a History of the U.S. Effort to Improve Latin Americans. And, and the basic message is that we have, since the very beginning, and now I really mean deep, deep back in the 19th century, we have had in our mind that the, the need to improve the people who live there beneath the United States, and I use beneath in, in more than just geographic term. Uh, Latin Americans all know this. It's not a secret. There, there are many countries, from, in the beginning, uh, with, the, say, the Peace Corps, uh, which, you know, what could be a more innocuous type of improvement? 
uh, governments like Mexico said we don't want any Peace Corps volunteers. And it's not that they didn't want Peace Corps volunteers, they didn't want the mental baggage that came along with this. Uh, the, the best thing that we could do to improve our relations with Cuba and with all of Latin America would be to frankly say that we want to protect our interests. Our interests are this, that, and the other thing, and whatever, the, and, and say, we are going to try to work with you to address these interests because they're of extreme importance to us. If they're not of extreme importance, we're, we're not going to bother. Uh, but, you know, what, what we do is we dress up this effort to improve Latin Americans in a, in a way that, that makes you think, well, are we any different at all from what the Russians were trying to do last year? It, 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 look, this, this soft hegemony, that it's, it's really, it's an alibi for power. And, and uh, every Latin American looks at it like that. You, you can't, and I mean, those of you who have been to Latin America and who have talked with Latin American students in particular, they've, they've grown up with this understanding that the United States thinks of them as inferior and that the United States for some reason, and that the some reason is our interest, but the United States is interested in improving them and getting them to stop doing what they're doing now because it's inferior and begin doing something different because it's better. And you, I mean, what, what could be less counterproductive, less productive for U.S. Latin American relations? So, so in a, I'm sorry, I do not mean to filibuster your question, but my answer is get out. Get out. Establish normal. Look, if it works all right with Norway, as Mr. Trump suggests, then it probably will work all right with Cuba, too. Uh, but, you know, heaven, heaven knows what you're going to do with Florida. I, I don't know if you noticed, but after the last census, uh, Florida passed New York and uh, as the third largest state in the Electoral College. And those of you with a little bit of gray hair will remember the Al Gore fiasco in the year 2000 when he lost Florida by 537 floor, when he lost the White House via the Electoral College by 537 Florida votes. Uh, I, I have no idea what you do about that. Now, what, what President Obama was doing when that slide where I, I had him going down to, down to Florida in 2008 when he was campaigning, what, what, he, what he knew, uh, or what his pollsters told him, is that the Republicans have got a firm grip on what are called the historicos, the, the historic immigrants from the early part of the Cuban Revolution. Uh, they have never forgiven John Kennedy for not falling, following through with the Bay of Pigs by sending in the Marines to get rid of the... the they are Republicans. They're going to be Republicans until the day they die. But the day they die is sooner rather than later. Okay. And, and look, Barack Obama, say what you will about him one way or the other, he had really, really good pollsters during that campaign. And what he was told is you've got to peel off some of the Cuban Americans. And you can peel off those early ones who still have family down in Cuba by saying, I'm going to let the Cuban Americans have the right to travel and send remittances, money to their relatives in Cuba. And, and you would attract those people and, but you never, you, you can't just say, I will not, I will allow that to happen. You have to say, oh, I'll keep the embargo but he had to word it in a way that made him sound tough. Like, it's time for the Cuban Americans to help us destroy the Castro government or overthrow the Castro government. But enough of my filibustering. Thank you for your talk.
um, at the end of October, I think it was, uh, a number of documents were released about the Kennedy administration, and some of them detailed a CIA uh, set of plans called Operation Northwood, which essentially described how they proposed to plan terrorist attacks in Miami, Florida, and Washington, and as well as on the boats between Cuba and Miami, and blame it on Cuba. Um, so I was wondering if you had any thoughts on that, and if you have any idea why, because that wasn't very widely reported, so I was curious. I, I had, you're telling me something for the first time. I have, I'm, I'm sorry, I have no reaction because I hadn't heard of it. It's called Operation Northwood? Uh, yeah, I can check later, but yeah, I'm pretty sure that's what it was. Uh, my immediate reaction is, of course, whatever, look, that was a time when there, there was a, a after, after the failure of the Bay of Pigs, the Kennedy administration basically went ballistic on the Castro government. It took a, a general, General Edward Lansdale, and made him the leader of an organization that called itself Operation Mongoose. The, and this Operation Mongoose was involved in myriad activities. Uh, basically, as I said, they were, they were state-sponsored terrorism. And, and the idea was, was just to, you know, it, what you would say, I, I, I just see the logic behind it, is what you do is you convince the American public that the Cubans are trying to bomb and destroy our country and make that attack a justification for a counterattack. And, and it doesn't surprise me at all. I, I, I've, I wish I knew something about it, though, so I didn't have to just give you a hypothesis. Thank you so much, thank you so much for coming. Um, I was curious, you, uh, sort of to go back to your initial analysis, what threat Cuba actually poses to the US? Now, of course, it's no longer militarily, but economically speaking. Um, it's so small and so clearly not functioning under its current system that I don't see why the US wouldn't just like let Cuba, I mean, to, to, to your point about Norway, but what, what threat might one perceive Cuba to have towards the US? Yeah, well, it, it, look, over the course of my lifetime, when I, when I was taking my first courses in international relations and foreign policy, there was always some place somewhere in the syllabus where someone said something like, uh, our politics stop at the water's edge. If the leader of the other party says that we have trouble, I will back that person, uh, regardless of whether it might cost me something politically or whatever. Uh, over the course of my lifetime, globalization has wrung the foreign out of foreign policy. It's just, it, there is nothing about U.S. Latin American relations that is not today dominated, dominated by domestic political concerns. Just look, look at the whole idea of this wall. That, look, look, at, look at immigration policy generally, look at NAFTA, look at drug policy. Uh, every one of those policy concerns is based on domestic political concerns and they involve constituencies that that in many cases we're discovering are extremely powerful. I mean, we, we used to talk about the Hispanic vote belonging to the Democrats, you know, and, and look what Mr. Trump has discovered. He, he's discovered that he can use, he, he, can, he can use issues of inter-American relations to build on, to build support from entirely different groups that can that can challenge the strength of the Democrats' hold on Hispanics. So that, look, the answer is domestic politics. If you were starting today to study inter-American relations for a career, you would want to study American politics first and foremost. Today, to look, in, in the good old days of political science, uh, what you did is you, you majored in, in uh, 
in comparative, if you were a Latin American, had a Latin, you majored in comparative politics, and you did a minor, your second major would be in international relations. Now it's got to be U.S. domestic politics, what we call American government. But you, you, if, you, if you're not proficient in understanding American government, then you just don't get U.S. policy toward Latin America. And uh, it's, it's really transformed the education of our current generations of graduate students. Can I have my dessert now? <laughs> I think so. Please join me in one more time thanking Professor Schultz.